Welcome everyone to uh, our maintainer talk about WITUS. This is the end of the day, so thank you for showing up and uh, welcome also to our online audience. Just next, the other way, just next. Ah, just okay, next. thank you. My name is Deepthi Sigaredi. I'm a software engineer at PlanetScale and I'm the tech lead for WITUS. Um, I will start off with a brief introduction to WITUS and uh, afterwards my co-speakers will talk about our Kubernetes operator, VT admin, which is a replacement for our existing control plane and uh, there are some demos. WITUS is a clustering system for horizontal scaling of MySQL or MariaDB. It's effectively a distributed database. It is a CNCF graduated project, the first storage project to graduate from CNCF. It's open source, Apache 2.0. We have contributors from uh, many different companies and a vibrant community in our Slack workspace. And it's mostly written in Golang. WITUS is a cloud-native database. It runs in Kubernetes. It was started at YouTube where it used to run in Borg, so it was a natural evolution for WITUS to be able to run in Kubernetes. It is scalable, highly available, all of those good things. WITUS provides certain durability guarantees that you don't get with vanilla MySQL. It also gives you the illusion of a single database. So behind the scenes, you might be running hundreds or thousands of individual database servers uh, in order to achieve the scalability and the high availability, but to an application, it looks like a single database. Applications can get single dedicated connections to WITES, which behind the scenes translate to many individual MySQL connections. And WITES can present as MySQL 5.7 or 8.0. It can run with MySQL 5.7 or 8.0, and it's compatible with many frameworks and ORMs. WITES serves millions of uh, QPS in production. There are many adopters of WITES running it in production uh, over the last six years. So WITES started about 11 years ago at YouTube, but over the last six years, a lot of um, outside companies have adopted it. Uh, notably, Slack runs all of their data on WITES. Square Cash runs everything on WITES. Uh, JD.com has a huge Kubernetes deployment of WITES with thousands of nodes and tens of thousands of WITES components. And PlanetScale runs a database service on WITES with, on WITES with thousands of individual WITES clusters. A few key concepts, and then we will do an architecture overview before we move on to the rest of the talk. Uh, the concepts that are important to know, to understand with us are key space, shard, cell. A key space is just a logical database. There may be thousands of physical databases, but it, it, it can present as a single logical database. And a shard is a subset of the logical database. The union of all the shards comprises your database as far as the application is concerned. And a cell is a failure domain. So depending on the availability uh, guarantees you want, you will deploy WITUS components in different cells. And a cell could be a data center, or it could be an individual server rack, or it could be an availability uh, zone, or a region, or something like that in a cloud provider. It is very common to run uh, databases today in a replicated configuration with a primary and replicas. When you run WITES in front of such a replicated configuration of MySQL, there is a WITES component that lives with each of those MySQLs called a VT tablet. In production, you typically run multiple clusters. They might be shards of the same key space or they may be multiple key spaces, that is multiple logical databases. All traffic goes through a component called VTGate. This is a proxy that pretends to be MySQL. It speaks the MySQL protocol. It looks like a single MySQL server to an application, and it figures out which actual MySQL the query needs to go to. And in order to scale out, depending on the application traffic, VTGates can be scaled up 
uh, as the traffic grows. And each BT gate will be able to route to any of the key spaces and shards. BT gate has to do this in a transparent way. As, as far as the application is concerned, there is only a database. And VT gate has to route them to the right uh, databases, the right shards, the right clusters. How does it do this? It does this by looking at the schema and the sharding scheme. Sharding scheme is what is also known as V schema or Vitas schema. This tells VT gate the necessary metadata in order for VT gate to figure out where to route the queries. The other component that is of interest in uh, Vitas deployment is the Topo server. This is a distributed key value store. People typically use etcd or Zookeeper or even Kubernetes as the Topo server. And this Topo server stores the configuration information that Vitas requires in order for the components to discover each other and in order for the query routing to work. And this is a pretty small data set. It is cached by VTGate. And one of the principles in Vitess is that the Topo server does not need to be up for applications to be able to query the database. The last thing I want to talk about is the control daemon. There is a component called VTCTLD, which allows you to perform management operations on the cluster. It works with the Topo. It gives you a view of the Topo, and it allows uh, the operators to perform manual failovers and things like that, all sorts of manual operations. Just briefly about uh, what is new in Vitas recently and what's coming up, we are doing our 12.0 release GA in about two weeks. We did a release candidate last week. Um, we have been improving the query support we have. There is still a small set of sub queries that are not supported, especially in sharded mode, but that set keeps getting smaller as we keep working. There have been a lot of performance improvements recently, and we also publish continuous benchmarks on benchmark.vitas.io. Coming up in the future, we have VT admin that you will hear a little more about uh, in a few minutes. And we are also going to complete support for multi-column indexes, automatic failure detection, also known as VT orc collations, and distributed transactions. With that, I'll hand it off to Alkin. All right. Thank you, Deepti, for the intro and the new features and what's coming up. Uh, my name is Alkin, and I work with Deepti at PlanScale as part of the uh, Vitesse open source team. And um, I'm one of the maintainers of the Vitesse project and um, many other things. So we'll talk about the, the operator. Um, as you know, we heard from the other talks, the operator and the Kubernetes are a recommended way of running uh, stateful applications, for, especially for databases. And there is also a Vitesse operator for Kubernetes, which is open source. And uh, what does it do beyond the regular operators? It does um, automation of Vitesse functions. And uh, basically, it helps with the, the cluster management and all that other flags and, and uh, the command line tools that you would have to run and uh, also um, keeps the consistency and, uh, and the failovers automated and it helps a lot. So, um, so I want to show you a little bit of the operator, how it does it. And um, because this is time consuming and, and it won't fit in this uh, part of the, the talk, um, we need to deploy a test cluster. In this case, it's going to be deployed in uh, GKE. And, um, and then we deploy the um, operator, which is a very low uh, footprint, and it, it's basically fast. Um, it's customizable. It's open source. And you could actually have to set up your own security users and, and the other settings that you would do normally. And then we will create a database um, and um, with the sharding workflow, which is um, these uh, links will be provided in, in the slides. Uh, we have um, operator examples that will run through a, a scenario. We'll shard a, a commerce schema, like an e-commerce database, to a customer database, which is sharded. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And, um, and then we're going to create some load on it. This is not for a benchmarking. It's for just to, to demonstrate that there's some activity in the database. 
And uh, as Deepti said, we run continuous benchmarks on our old releases and, and deploys. Um, that's separate from this uh, talk. And uh, also, we do online DDL on, uh, right. on this environment and then uh, running the uh, sharded, fail, uh, sharded cluster. And I want to demonstrate a failover while running the load and the online DDL and everything else. So this is basically a, a debate between the, the stateful databases in Kubernetes running with operator under the BTS. So, okay, there's gonna be a workflow, I'll talk about it, and, and I have the um, GitHub link for the, uh, the demo. So first of all, uh, that's not correct. Okay, this one, hopefully you can see this. I'm gonna start this. So we have, um, Kubernetes cluster that's already deployed, and um, and then running with the with the with test operator, and basically the operator has one pod. There's three pods for etcd, and uh, and then we have um, since we already ran the sharded uh, cluster, we have a commerce and um, and a customer key spaces, which they have a VT tablets as a pod. So also um, we have um, some some um, VTCTLD and VTGate pods in this cluster and, um, and already running along with the operator. And uh, what I wanted to do is um, to deploy some load and two pods, it's going to deploy, uh, select and, and insert recursive on this uh, database in Keyspace uh, customer and it will create some load on it. And um, we have the customer table and uh, we have the order table, it's called C order. And then uh, as we run these uh, DB load pods, which are actually uh, Docker images that's pre-created, we have all documented all the, on the link that I mentioned. Um, if you want to try this yourself, it's very easy to do this. And, um, and then we generate some load on the uh, sharded cluster and, and then the, the traffic starts coming in uh, for the sake of this demo. <coughs> and um, so the, the inserts are increasing, the, the number of rows are increasing, and then um, the cluster is healthy, running with the operator. An operator actually manages everything. So if, if in, in this case of, of Kubernetes, if a pod was killed, it will reinstate and, uh, and then recover the pod from the existing image. And then if it's a replica, it will fail over to, to primary and we we'll do all of that. So what we're gonna do in this uh, example over here, we have a, a table called C order and it has uh, multiple columns. SKU is the one of them, it's var binary uh, 128 uh, default. Now I set the, um, DDL strategy, which we mentioned, we do online DDL and, and we test world, uh, and then to online, and then invoke this um, DDL with alter table, and then it becomes a migration. The migration gets executed behind the scenes without impacting the load, or the um, there's no like locking or anything. It's it's uh, it's online, and uh, and then we can see the the migration status that's running and uh, running on a customer uh, key space on a sharded. Uh, there are two, sh two shards in this example, and each shard has one primary and one replica running under this uh, Kubernetes cluster. And, um, and then we can see it's actually, um, the tablets are, are healthy, uh, whether from the command line example over here from MySQL or from the Vitesse commands that you can do it, look at it uh, also, there's an option to see from the Kubernetes end. There are multiple points of access to this whole cluster where you want to manage, but the demonstration over here is using the VTCTL client, the Vitesse command line, and then there's the MySQL client that's actually um, accessing the cluster. And, and also um, we have uh, the, the primary and replica set up for this uh, customer key space. You can see in the, in the customer, uh, sharded replicas, we have um, two um, primaries. What I wanted to show over here, while the load is running, uh, there is a, there's a replica uh, ended with 4223, and I want to actually say, I want to fail over to this. Just, th I think that the, the, the primary on this 
uh, shard is not doing well, just a, a, a scenario over here, um, and I want to fail over to, um, to the replica, while the, the, the migration, the alter is running on that cluster, on the sharded cluster, I can actually uh, tell VTS, okay, fail over to this um, uh, shard. This is called a planned reparent shard uh, because I know this is not an emergency. I'm planning this um, and, and, and I invoke. And um, because um, it's a small cluster, it, it becomes available and then it uh, flips over. So when, when we test, uh, when you tell Vitesse that I want to get this, this replica become a primary and uh, it will actually take the other one if the, if the, uh, the old one is, is available, it'll actually detach and, and attach as a replica. So always have one replica available. Um, of course, in production, you would have multiple replicas, not just one, at least two, and, and, and then you could actually set them in different uh, regions. So, um, so that's it, and we'll go back to the workflow. So what we did is we ran the 101 example, it's in VTSIO, and then we created a load with an example Docker image, uh, did a recursive select and insert, and we graphed, there's a load coming in, we execute an online DDL while, while all this running, and then we failed over uh, in one of the shards from a replica to a, to a master, uh, to, to primary, and then, and then we were able to continue the load. Thank you. All right, my, uh, my friend uh, Andrew will come over and uh, do this. Okay, we're gonna switch over laptops real quick. Just doing a planned uh, reparent. Planned laptop. reparent laptop. Yeah. Okay. Give you a little taste of the humor you can expect. Okay. All right. Okay, my demo is done. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Andrew Mason. I am a senior. Oh, yeah, I can take my mask off. You can probably hear me a lot better. Um, hi, my name is Andrew Mason. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at Slack, and I am a maintainer on the Vitesse project. And I'm here to talk to you about something that I and a couple other people have been working on called VT Admin. Uh, as Deepthi was saying earlier, uh, VT Admin is the next generation of uh, cluster management and uh, web UI tooling for, for cluster management. Um, it will eventually replace the VTC TLD, which we just saw in, in Alkin's demo. Um, so I'm gonna kind of do a demo and talk at the same time, so we'll see how that goes. Um, in, in the original case, uh, you have a single Vitesse cluster, which is like a, uh, let me jump through here. So different version of what DP showed you earlier. Um, Basically, everything that talks to the topo, I consider to be a single Vitesse cluster. So we have the application going to the VT gate, going to the tablets, and then on the side, we have the topo and the VTC TLD, just like we saw before. And what VT admin is going to let us do, and that, you know, oh boy, uh, bigger, 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 bigger. Um, and that, you know, looks like this. So I have some shards, I have some not serving. Don't worry about that, we'll come back to that later. Um, and what VT admin does is VT admin is going to sit in front of these VTC TLDs and allow you to manage multiple completely isolated deployments at the same time. So that looks like this. So we took that one chart and shrunk it down and stamped out two more of them and we have a single VT admin API and VT admin web that sits in front of uh, all three clusters where this is useful, just as a trivial example, is if you have prod, dev, and QA, you would like them to not overlap and not clobber each other. Um, so you can have them completely isolated from each other and then stick a VT admin and have traffic, admin traffic flow only one way, application traffic being completely separate. Um, so in words, it's a single control plane for multiple Vitesse deployments, which, uh, or we use the very overloaded but useful term of cluster. Uh, it provides both gRPC and HTTP API endpoints for you to program against. If you want to build any automation on top of VT admin API, you can do that. Um, there's also UI for human-friendly uh, use of the tool. Um, the backend is written in Go along with the rest of the Vitesse project, and we're using React on the front end. 
Uh, and the goal here being to eventually replace the existing VTC TLD UI, which is for a single cluster. And VTM, it works just as well if you only have one cluster, but you get you know, more power out of it from having a many-to-one relationship. And so there's a branch, which you can get from the slides. Um, so here I have a local deployment running on my laptop. So to be a little small and use our imaginations a little bit because um, my laptop is not very large. So I have two, uh, two clusters, one having a single key space called media, which has two shards, 0 to 80 and 80 to 0, and then four non-serving shards, which I will get to in a moment. And then I have a second cluster over here, which has a single uncharted commerce key space. And from the VT admin view, I get to see everything in one place. So I can go through, I see I have two clusters. Each cluster has a VT gate. They're called local one and local two. Uh, key spaces as before. Schemas with sizes. I can look at the schema. I can see how they are sharded. Um, and one of the other useful things to do in the tests, which has not been talked about, I think, is a thing called VT explain, which is basically a MySQL explain plan, but the test style. Um, so you can sort of see how the test will route a query uh, based on the sharding scheme. So I can go into VT admin, and I can go here, select star from books, and unsurprisingly, this will go to every shard in the key space because in order to collect everything, we have to go everywhere. But if I'm going to pin it down based on a single sharding key, and this is actually my most popular, my personal most common use of VT explain is to see where a particular row lives. So where in this logical database does this row actually live? So I can go to the tablets in that shard and do some diagnostics. Um, so I can see that ID 10 gets mapped to shard media-80. And that is pretty much VT admin. So now, as you grow over time, uh, your sharding may end up not fitting in the space that you allot anymore. So right now I have two shards, but I have a whole bunch more users and so a whole bunch more data, and now my data doesn't fit onto two shards anymore. So I'm going to use a feature of a test called reshard to uh, live without taking downtime, take my data that's on two shards and split it across four shards. And we're gonna see what that looks like inside of VT admin. Um, so that is what these other four shards are for. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to workflows, which is where things are going to show up. And the AP has made my thing tiny. That looks sufficiently large. Um, okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I've done a bunch of prep work. I've inserted some test data. I've spun everything up. I've created all the shards because it takes forever. Um, so I'm going to go right to it, and I'm going to create two workflows, one for going from dash 80 to 40, uh, boy, uh, 40 and 40, 80, and then a second workflow going from 80 to 80, C0, C0 to the end of the key range. Um, you can reshard the entire key space with a single workflow, we have found in our personal experience that when you are operating on sufficiently large key spaces and you have dozens to hundreds of shards, it becomes trickier to manage with like retrying and restarting and doing cutovers and piecemeal. So we like to create one workflow per source to destination, um, which is why I'm doing this way. go. So that's the first workflow created, and I can hop over to VTM and, and reload. Here's the one that's up and running, and here's the one that is coming up. Uh, and so if I click in here, I can see that the stream is lagged a little bit because we just finished copying data over. Um, so this workflow is actually composed of two streams, one going from the source to the left-hand side and the other going from the source to the right-hand side. And if I look at one of these streams, oh, that's the JSON view. Uh, we don't want that. I can go to a tablet 
And we can see that there's no real QPS, but there is vReplication QPS, which is to be expected. And now, if I throw some traffic, there we go. Oh no, am I in the wrong directory? So we'll send some rows over here, and now we can see QPS skyrockets as expected. I'm going to kill that before it ruins my demo. Um, and so at this point, we now have two streams running, or two workflows running, four streams total, copying data from our sources to our destinations. And now we are going to wait for things to catch up. And while we do that, Malcolm is going to fill us in on some of the work that's going to tie in here. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction and demo of VT Admin, Andrew. Hi, everybody. My name is Malcolm McKinjay, and I'm a software engineer at Slack on the data stores team, and a recent graduate of Tufts University, class of 2020. Go Jumbos. Uh, this past year, I've had the fortunate opportunity of being able to contribute to the tests, mainly focusing on the resharding workflows and the entire resharding experience. Most recently, I've been focusing on the VDIF step of that resharding experience. VDIF is the only optional step of a resharding experience, but is immensely critical when wanting to validate that the prior steps of your resharding workflow have ran to completion and ran as intended. What VDIF does is that it takes a diff between your target and source shards to actually validate that the data that you've copied over is there, uh, and it validates if that the data, thank you. Uh, and it validates that the, there is no extra data that has been copied over, any data that you did not intend to be uh, in your destination charts. Uh, at Slack, we currently manage one of the largest Vitesse clusters in production. And because of that, uh, due to our scale, we do end up in certain situations where we run into certain bottlenecks or unintended situations that is only due to our scale. Most recently, that has been noticed in VDIF. Uh, if we step into VDIF specifically, uh, what happens is that VDIF mainly, uh, all of the work happens in the VTC TLD. All of the, most of the load is generated on the VTC TLD, and also you need to run one VDIF per source shard. So if you're splitting one shard to two or two to four, you'll need uh, one VDIF or two and two VDIFs respectively. And at Slack, when we run a VDIF in production, it normally ends up around averaging seven hours. So if you're running one VDIF, things are okay. You can run it and finish it by the end of the workday. Uh, but as that number increases, you need to run these VDIFs either sequentially, so back to back, or you can run them manually in parallel. Running them sequentially leads you into the issue of you run one VDIF, you come back seven hours later, hopefully it's done, and then you run, the, you run the next one. That obviously becomes a more, uh, that be obviously becomes more unmanageable as the amount of VDIFs you need to run increases. And then you step into the world of, okay, let me try to run these VDIFs uh, in parallel. When you want to run these VDIFs in parallel, since they're blocking calls, what normally happens is that you end up running multiple screens or multiple tmuxes. And a common scenario at Slack is that we'll be splitting more than one or two shards. And in that case, you'll be juggling maybe six plus tmuxes and screen sessions at one time, but you're also now doing this in parallel, and one VDIF is already generating load on a VTC TLD, so what happens when you want to run two, three, or four? You can generate so much load on a VTC TLD that you could be in risk of actually bringing that entire service down, which is what you don't want. Uh, so what will then happen after that is, okay, maybe you're running more than one VTC TLD. You're now juggling multiple screens or multiple TMXs on multiple different hosts, and that entire process is cumbersome at times. So what ended up happening over the past six months uh, while I've been at Slack, as I have worked on an in-house tool uh, built on top of our existing VTOps uh, binary at Slack, which allows us to interact with our, topology, uh, with our cluster 
and it will orchestrate VDIFs, and it will work with our concurrency limit, and it will allow us to spread out all of the load on all of our VTC TLDs and also allow VDIFs to run back to back. So even if VDIF finishes at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night, it'll kick off the next one on the list. So this is sort of what the output will look like. Uh, you'll end up in queuing your VDIF. Uh, you specify your source cell, your target cell, uh, what tablet types do you want to use for this VDIF, and the workflows you actually want to run. Uh, we have our uh, service discovery, which will end up finding these uh, VTC TLDs. And from there, you start your VDIF workers. And the VDIF workers are tied to a specific VTC TLD. And all they do is grab one workflow and then send that request to a VTC TLD. And when it's done, it will grab another one. Uh, you can specify the number of VT, uh, VDIF workers you want. And with that, you can also increase the number, yeah, you can increase the number of VDIF workers, and each VDIF worker will take one workflow. Um, yep. And so I will actually spin up a couple VDIFs right now in order to show you how the tool works. So right here, as Andrew said previously, we have done some of the work before, so these commands are already here. But in this example, we have VTOps VDIF workflow. I'll copy this whole line. And we should be able to run this right here. And so right now, the VDIF has started on these VTC TLDs that we have spun up for this demo. And currently, it's running. And so while this is running, we can talk about what we are looking forward to for the future of VDIF. Uh, the future goals of VDIF is actually to move VDIF from the VTC TLD layer down to the tablet layer in order to uh, relieve some of the pressure from those VTC TLDs and allow VDIF to be a lot more scalable uh, than it currently is, which will then make the entire resharding experience a lot better and a lot more streamlined. And if we look back here, what we can see is that in the output of this command, VDIF for media 80 dash is completed, uh, VDIF for media dash 80 is completed, and in this, diff found false shows you what VTC TLD was used, and it also shows you the output. So the VDIF will tell you how many rows were processed, how many rows were matching, if there were extra rows, as I mentioned before, and this is grouped by workflow and then by table. And so now since VDIF is run and VDIF has validated that our copying of data has gone successfully and that there are no extra rows and that everything is matching as uh, expected, we can now cut over. And so if I step right here, first command will be to switch traffic on read-onlys and replicas. Traffic, switch traffic was successful, so now if we take a look back in VT admin, we should see a difference inside of our, step into the key space and we step into media you should see you are set to switch packets. Okay. So now after that's successful, we will switch the primaries. Switch traffic was su successful. And now all reads are switched. Uh, Writes not switched, that was the start state, and the current state now is all reads are switched and writes are switched. So the destination shards should be taking, uh, they would be taking traffic right now. So now if we head here and refresh the page, we can see now that the original uh, source shards, dash 80, and yeah, the, the original source shards are no longer serving, and the destination shards are now the serving shards here. And so 
with all of that said, thank you for your time. I appreciate everyone who was able to make it here. I appreciate everyone who was able to meet with us online and watch our talk. Uh, feel free to check out the Vitesse docs at vitesse.io slash docs, uh, the GitHub repository and the link in the slides, as well as if you have any uh, questions or after this talk, feel free to message us in Slack at vitesse.slack.com. Thank you. I guess we are out of time, or do we have time for questions? Okay. Sure. Okay. There was one question online. Cool. Would you like to do that one? The only, before we take that question, we also do have office hours tomorrow at 11.30 Pacific uh, for people that think of questions later. <laughs> so there's two online. Oh. I'll give you the first one and then we can see if anyone else in the room has one. Does the test require a storage manager like Rook or Coreworks, or does it utilize and manage the local storage architecture? Um, I'll take that one. Yeah. Vitus does not require a storage. Sorry. So the question was, does Vitus require a storage manager like Rook or Portworks, or uh, does it manage local storage on its own? Vitus does not require a storage manager like Ceph or, uh, or like Rook or Portworks. It can work with cloud storage or network attached storage or local storage. Um, in when why, when running with the Kubernetes operator, most people use cloud storage like um, Amazon. EBS. I'm blanking on the yeah. EBS yeah. or GCS, Google Cloud Storage. But people have also run Vitus with Ceph. So uh, storage managers are optional. Any questions from the room? What was the other question? You, you said there were two questions. We're going Let's do Carson's question. Oh. Um, so, BT admin, I may have missed in the slide. It's talking to BTLD. Yes. You know, this information, not the topology server directly. No, everything is done. Oh, uh, so the question was uh, for VT admin, does it talk to the VTC TLD or does it ever talk to the Tilbo directly? And uh, it only ever talks to the VTC TLD. <laughs> There's a couple of things that go through the tablets, or sorry, for, through the VT gates. Um, because VTKs have a different view of the health of the tablets, so that's what's powering those those tablets serving not serving. Um, if I go like this, this uh, one, two, three, fourth column, um, that's coming from the gates because we are interested in what the gates think about tablet health because it affects query serving um, versus what's in the topo, which is delayed basically. Um, but other than that, everything goes directly to the VTC TLD. At which then proxies the Tobo. And then I saw there, there were uh, quite a few things where you would go back to run your man to kind of initiate workflow to do that. Is the intent to bring, take this more? Right now it seems very, which is fine, it's like a yeah. great UI. I mean, yes. Know, yep. To make it more, have more of an interface, not a view. Yes. Uh, so, it, Commands have to be run from the CLI. Uh, VTM is mostly read only, is the plan to, to make it more powerful than just, just a read-only, a very good read-only UI. And yes, that, that's the plan, that's where we're going. The VTC, that's part of the VTC TLD parity is the VTC TLD UI lets you do all of those uh, like destructive administrative operations and we're, we're getting there. Yep. Okay. Bye stream. Uh, we support 5.7 and 8.0 and the minor versions of those two major versions. We used to support 5.6. We don't really support it anymore because it's been end of, end of life. Um, Vitus can work with the Percona distribution of MySQL, um, Oracle Community Edition, Enterprise Edition, MariaDB, uh, almost all the variants. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.